Okay. Paulo, we can start now. Okay. Okay, hello everyone, all my dear friends around the world. Welcome to the hot seat, first session. And we are very happy to be your host this evening. I'm joining you all from Tehran and one of our dear friends, a master clinician, Paulo Carvalho is joining us from Portugal. And we are happy that we are with all you today and hope you're safe in these days and enjoying your uh, time everywhere in the world. I hope that the presentation today will be beneficial for all of you. Uh, my dear friend Paulo, as a tradition, I'm going to have a very brief introduction of him. Uh, he is a doctor of dental surgery in Oporto University, Portugal, postgraduate in pandemic postgraduate in advanced oral surgery and autologous bone grafts by Implant Brazil, postgraduate in mucogingival and peritoneal surgery, residence in aesthetic dental rehabilitation and foramen dental education, teacher in private courses of implantology and oral rehabilitation, and main coordinator of implant prosthetics, clinical residency at foramen dental education. He's a speaker at many, many national or international events I'm pretty sure if you don't know this guy, I'm sure that definitely you don't want to miss his presentations. And you can also go to his Instagram page and Facebook pages and enjoy his highly skilled uh, executed cases. And all I can say is this, because you will see his presentation and you will get what I'm saying. The topic that he will present for us today is how much bone do we really need around implants? Because it's one of the topics that very important for our predictable treatment in implant dentistry. And sometimes it leads to severe complications and clinicians really looking for the best type of solutions. So prevention is always better. And I'm pretty sure Paulo is gonna cover many, many aspects in this topic. I'm not gonna wait you much longer and Paulo, we are ready from head to toe to hear your presentation, and then we will have a discussion at the end. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, Omid, for um, this introduction, this very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really honored uh, about it, really flattered. And, um, and I'm also um, trying to make the expectations, the high expectations of, the, of being your, uh, your first host um so let me start into my presentation so i'll share my screen now okay siri here let me know if i can help sorry siri got in the way okay are you seeing my screen now perfect it's perfect now Perfect. Okay. So today, like Omid um, told, I'm, I'm here to present a very specific topic. Um, I would like to ask, to answer to this question, how much bone do we really need around dental implants? Uh, because it's, um, it's a very hot topic in the moment, and it's something that um, I face in a daily routine, which is uh, the problematic of which cases do I need to graft which cases do I not uh, need to graft or which cases it's uh, too risky to go uh, in one way or another. Uh, first of all, let me uh, present a little bit more in a personal way. I came from Porto, which is the second biggest city uh, in Portugal. Uh, I live here and I work here. Uh, it's an amazing place to live and work. Um, and if you have the opportunity to visit uh, one of these days, it, it will be amazing for uh, for you guys. I've, I've hosted um, an Iranian uh, doctor, a friend of Omid, recently, and I, I think he got a very nice time here. Um, so, for today, I want to present this.
Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I said so many stuff to cover. Yeah, no, I will not. I will not go deeply in 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 all these questions. But all those questions are going to be uh, implicit inside the topic. So what I would like to uh, answer, like I told you guys, is uh, to answer this question: How much bone do we really need around dental implants? So first of all, it is uh, a general knowledge that uh, when we are placing implants in yield ridges we need a minimum of two millimeters thickness um, buckley to the implant placement uh, in order not to have um, the resortion of the of the vocal cortical wall and especially when uh, there are a lot of studies that that proves that when the, the that remaining thickness is less than 1.4 millimeters uh, it's the resortion is going to be even higher and it's that is easy to understand when we realize that two millimeters minimum uh, is what it takes to be certain that we are keeping enough medullar bone that is going to supply the cortical plate. Without these two millimeters, when it is less than that, it is very probable that we don't have enough cancellous bone that is going to supply our cortical plate and then cortical plate in function, the implant is going to be uh, resorbed and the implant is going to be without any buccal bone. But modern implantology, it's more and more uh, obvious that also the thickness is an issue. The thickness of the tissue is an issue, not only the bone. So especially there is a lot of uh, data nowadays and it has been uh, widely studied in the past how the uh, periodontum um, around an implant is different than the one that we find around the tooth. That's, you, you know that you're going to need much more thickness of soft tissue around an implant than you need around the tooth because around the tooth, you have a, a real connective tissue attachment to the uh, cementum of the roots, which you don't have around an implant where the collagen fibers are parallel to the surface of the implant and the abutments. So, we know from some studies that around 1.2, around one to two millimeters, um, it's what occupies the inflammatory infiltrate. That inflammatory infiltrate comes from the plaque that we have around our teeth, uh, the trauma of the brushing, eating, everything. So you need to overcome those two millimeters in order to have the minimum of soft tissue thickness to prevent a dehiscence. So. Modern implantology is nowadays very aware of the importance of the thickness of the soft tissue in order to prevent bone resorption as well, and not only focus only on the bone. But it was with the recent studies and recent use from Thomas Linkovicius that we are more clinically aware of the importance of the vertical soft tissue thickness. The vertical soft tissue thickness has been studied before that, but clinically we're, we were not so aware of that, and nowadays, it's pretty, um, it's pretty uh, common knowledge that um, you need to keep a minimum of three to four millimeters of soft tissue vertical thickness. It is the, the ideal amount of soft tissue uh, uh, thickness in a vertical way to prevent the marginal bone loss. And thanks to Thomas Linkovicius, nowadays it's clear for all the clinicians around the world we are doing in pathology in a daily routine. But regarding to the horizontal soft tissue thickness, there is not a real scientific evidence that proves that the soft tissue horizontal thickness is going to provide is going to prevent marginal bone loss. So it seems that the vertical soft tissue thickness is critical for preventing the marginal bone loss. But the horizontal thickness, it's not um, it's not mandatory. To, uh, to promote that ceiling that is going to protect our bo marginal bone loss. Mainly, the horizontal uh, soft tissue thickness is going to play a bigger role in the aesthetic support of our restorations for a better aesthetic outcome and for comfort for the patient, for cleaning, etc., and not exactly to prevent the bone loss. So at this point, it is clear to us, like uh, Fernando Rojas Vizcaya already in his 3A2B, a philosophy taught us that our implants should be uh, uh, keeping a minimum of two millimeters of bone buckley to the implant and 
also take care of the deepness of the implants because they should be three to four millimeters uh, deepening, deepen uh, according to the desired final margin of our restoration. But still there is not um, real data, it's not, there is not um, real scientific evidence or studies that talk about how much bone do I really need to um, around my implants. I don't have uh, real scientific data on that. What I really find extensively in the literature is the amount of factors that influence the position of the hard and soft tissue margins around implants. And of course, there's a lot of influencing factors. The quality of the mucosa, if it's keratinized or non-keratinized, the, the, the attachment of the mucosa, if it has mobility or not, the, the thickness of the soft tissue, the thickness in the level of the buccal bone, the 3D position of the implant, the level of the, the interproximal bone peaks, uh, and um, the design, the geometry of my of the neck of my implant, the connection, and obviously the surgical technique, because it also plays a role uh, in in all of this. So, my daily fight in uh, oral implantology, and I think it's a, a common fight of all of us, is the constant battle not to lose tissue, harm in soft tissue around our implants, is to battle for the stability of the harm in soft tissues over time. And there is um, widely, um, a, a wide discuss about the importance of keratinized gingiva. But I, I should mention that uh, when we want keratinized gingiva around my implants, or around teeth, is because we tend to think that when we have keratinized uh, gingiva, that tissue is not going to move, is non-mobile. But that's not always true because keratinized gingiva and non-mobile gingiva, they are, they are not always the same because we can have keratinized gingiva that can move, that has mobility. I can remember of two situations in which keratinized gingiva can move. Let's see that every time in a um, remaining in a, in a heel crest, the remaining soft tissue has less than two millimeters of width of keratinized gingiva. There is probably, probably that two millimeters of keratinized gingiva is going to match the sulcus and the marginal junctional uh, um, tissue of, of uh, our uh, biologic width. So it is going to be mobile. And also when we want to do a free gingival graft and in the deepening of the vestibulum, we leave a lot of uh, muscular fibers, fibers. And those ways, our vascularized bed for our free gingival graft is going to be mobile. So our free gingival graft might integrate, might regenerate, but it's going to be immobile. So in those two situations, we can have cretinized gingival that still moves with our leaf movement. But especially when we have less than two millimeters of width of keratinized gingiva is pretty much probable that our keratinized gingiva is going to move. And the problem is mobility, not keratinization. Because keratinized tissue, yes, is comfortable for the patient. In some cases, it's more aesthetic. And of course, uh, it can provide a little bit more comfort for cleaning and for hygiene. But if it moves, any circular tissue around implants that has mobility, it's going to, prov to prov provide and allow contamination because every time I move the lips to speak, to eat, to brush, we are going to have entrance of bacteria and um, uh, inflammatory uh, infiltration inside my, uh, my pockets and I'm going to have um, the beginning of a perimplantitis perhaps. So for me, it's really important not only to have keratinized tissue, but to promote that my tissue is attached, is not mobile. So it is very common in my daily practice that I, in the diagnosis before rehabilitating an implant in the um, healing abutment uh, stage, or when the implant is already rehabilitated in it, and I want to see how, it's, uh, how it is going, I always move the lip of the patient uh, in, in a, in a um, insistent way so I can analyze what happens to the tissue. If the soccer tissue is moving, it's going to allow contamination inside 
the, um, the, 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 the perimplant tissue of, of the et implant. So it is very important to understand this concept. And we know already that we don't have a real attachment of the connective tissue around implants like we have in tip. But there is still some kind of attachment. There is enough data nowadays that um, proves to us how the, 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 the connective tissue can have some kind of amidesmosomas um, to attach to our titanium abutments or other type of materials like zirconia, for instance. So we have the first millimeters are going to act like a marginal junctional epithelium. In most of the times, two millimeters uh, um, uh, of distance are going to act like a marginal junctional epithelium. So it, it doesn't promote a real sealing around uh, our implants. So we need more deepness. We need more, more vertical um, uh, soft tissue thickness in order to promote a real adherence zone. And that's why when we unscrew uh, our provisionals or our crowns, we a lot of times see not only the first uh, area of uh, blood vessels that we see, it's, uh, it has a good blood supply, but probably it was not attached to my abutments in my subcritical contour of the crown. But in the deeper area of the emergence profile, you can see how there is real bleeding. And that real bleeding uh, means that we have we had real adherence and we had a real ceiling. So we might not have the same type of um, attachment uh, as the connective tissue, tissue attachment that, that we have to the roots, to the cementum, but we need to ensure that we have some kind of attachment, um, uh, some kind of ceiling around our uh, dental implants in about uh, around our uh, our abutments. So the thickness plays a good role on it. And this horizontal and vertical thickness, it's really important to prevent any type of contamination. And it's going to be not only important for the stability of the soft tissue, the margin for aesthetic reasons, but also to allow the, the patient to clean, to be comfortable and to prevent uh, the um, marginal bone loss as well. And of course, we should not underestimate the prosthetic symbols. So, Nowadays, again, with Thomas Lankovicius, we have like uh, a Bible for this surgical and prosthetic approach in which it's really important not only uh, to be aware of these surgical principles, but also the prosthetic ones. So we know the soft tissue thickness, it's important in plant death, but also the, 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 all the uh, principles around the prosthetic part, what happens in the transition zone, uh, especially the design of the, of the, of the prosthesis, the material used, including the, the, the selection of the, the titanium base abutment, the height of the color of, the, uh, of that uh, abutment, the subgingival uh, uh, crown contour, all of that plays an important role in this recipe, surgically and prosthetically speaking, that is going to help uh, to protect our bone. So now, until now, we know how much bone is needed for the ideal conditions and we know how to maintain that bone over time, how to keep that bone stable over time. But a lot of times we know that for placing implants in our healed crest, we don't have enough uh, bone for placing our implants and we don't have enough bone to have our implants uh, 300 degrees surrounded by, by bone. So in those cases, how, how, how should I rebuild the bone? And when to rebuild the bone? In which stage of the treatment? But most of all, a lot of times I ask myself, is it really needed to rebuild the bone? So about bone grafting procedures, I'm a fan of soft tissue because as I don't have the same surgical skills as Omid who can uh, uh, rebuild tons of bone, amazing, uh, reconstructions of big defects with the same predictability. So I, I want to know which situations I, I will need to struggle in um, bone augmentations because when I face in bone augmentations, I think it's um, very common to a lot of clinicians. And for example, the, the, the uh, consensus report of the group four in the 15th European workshop of periodontal bone 
uh, regeneration, um, there, there was these conclusions on, uh, uh, on this consensus about regeneration of the early regenerative effects. It's, it's some conclusions that I really agree. And this, this is what I really feel in my daily routine, that there is a wide range of horizontal and vertical techniques that are successful in short term, of course. And there's, um, but there's also the dark side, which is there is a high incidence of surgical uh, and post-op complications associated with these procedures, especially in vertical augmentation, especially when we, we need to augment vertically. Uh, that is a very difficult technique, a very highly technique sensitive uh, procedure in which I can always be that predictable. And what I see in a lot of studies about um, 3D bone grafting procedures is there is not huge data and huge scientific evidence that can uh, support the long-term stability of those bone regenerations. The, the, the keeping of the, the um, uh, marginal bone and the few studies that evaluate the long-term outcomes of these bone grafting procedures present different levels of marginal bone loss. And what I see in, uh, um, in, in happening in a lot of cases with a lot of uh, highly skilled tech, uh, clinicians is that um, with time, a lot of times, even a, a very good grafting uh, procedure is difficult to maintain the stability of the marginal bone over time. So it's already difficult to do a very good grafting procedure that in the reopening we can find really good bone, but also the successful cases in short term, in the long run, sometimes it's difficult to maintain the level of the bone and we see some, um, we see some uh, resortions during time that a lot of clinicians nowadays are talking. And we know, we, uh, um, we know in, the, in the corridors of the congresses, a lot of times I talk to a lot of speakers and they tell me, you know what, I'm, I'm facing the same, I'm having the same problems, you know, yes, even the most perfect cases at the beginning, it's difficult to maintain the bone over time. And that's why I'm a fan of soft tissue grafting, because in the soft tissue grafting, what happens is totally the opposite, is that if I do it right, and of course it's technically sensitive, and the learning curve is difficult, but when you reach certain kinds of level of mucogingival approach, every time you do those kind of procedures, it's very consistent. You always achieve the same results. And especially, it gets better with time. Most of the times, it increases the, with time the volume. It keeps even better the integration. Uh, the aesthetic outcome, it's better and better and better. So what do I want for my daily routine is something that can only be better with time that allow me to uh, sleep very safe every night knowing that it's not going to resolve and it's going to be even better with the bone i don't feel that and of course in my hands some defect is really difficult to um uh, to match always the same time so i want to know which cases i can do only with soft tissue, in which cases do I need to augment? My main difficulties in augmentations are when I use um, two occlusive barriers, but that's my um, personal experience. Uh, I know there's a lot of data about uh, using non resorbable membranes with like PTFE membranes uh, with titanium reinforcement, but what it seems to be happening in my hands is that those barriers are too occlusive. And especially when we use mixing of non-osteogenic materials, even though we can use autogenous bone for the, for the osteogenic potential, I see some failures in grasped revascularization. So I can have a, a guided bone regeneration. The bone is really organized and excluded from soft tissue. But a lot of times I feel there are some failures in uh, the bone organization, the bone maturation, and the bone revascularization. So nowadays, I tend to go more and more 
for um, techniques that allow me to do it with 100% autogenous bone, like the Cure technique. Because, um, of course, using 100% of autogenous bone, the osteogenic potential is so much higher, but especially using the cortical plates thin only to act like a barrier and using inside chips that will act like cancellous bone, the vascularization is so much faster, so much efficient. Uh, and especially the cortical plates around the scaffold that, com that compounds the, the scaffold um, is going also to prevent the usual resorption in time that we see in the autogenous bone. So it's really important to have that cortical plate that will um, allow enough time for the maturation of the grafts inside the scaffold and prevent that uh, that resorption. So this is nowadays my uh, my um, uh, favorite technique for uh, big bone augmentations. When we talk about big bone augmentations, slight small dihiscences, I don't need to go for something that's that's complicated. So let's see a case um, with with that concept. We see here um, a, a, a huge complication in the lower anterior jaw uh, with failing implants. Actually, those implants were coming out and in with the prosthesis. The, pros the, the patient was uh, wearing like a removable implants, prosthesis, everything. And we have a, a big vertical and horizontal defect. So this type of um, cases, we really need to um, use um, this type of techniques that allows us to have uh, we need um, non-resorbable uh, barriers uh, like these cortical plates that will allow us um, to really exclude the, the soft tissues. You see the harvesting of the, the, the block from the ramus. We split the, the block in two so we can have a cortical plate for the buccal and another one for the lingual, trying to match the ideal vertical position. This is a very well-known um, concept for achieving passive uh, tension-free closure of the flaps. So um, doing a cut on the periosteum, cutting the periosteum, and then brushing. And in this case, it was also needed to uh, separate the muscle fibers from the advancing flap because the, um, the, the muscle fibers were um, attached to the, the granulation tissue from the that defect and now we can screw these cortical plates around the defects creating a scaffold it seems easy in an edited video but in uh, during a surgery it's really stressful it's really difficult to do it it's really time consuming, stress consuming, and it's not easy and it's not, we can't always do exactly the same. So now after collecting autogenous chips that I like to collect with a, with a collecting burr that collects already the bone in chips, we can tightly pack these bone chips inside the defects. And we can also with tension free sutures, we can passively close the flaps and as we separated the muscles from the advanced, advancing flap, we can have this type of, uh, this type of uh, advancements and look to the cretinized tissue that we created on top of the crest. You can see how uh, there is a much better pink and white balance. And after five months, actually we needed only four months. It's what is needed with the 100% autogenous bone graft. It's what is needed to re-enter a graft like this. We expose the areas that we previously knew there was the, the, the screws for fixation of the cortical. We access the bone. The first one, two millimeters are not well organized. We should have probably tighten a little bit more the autosome chips or use a collagen membrane to uh, prevent the the, the, the the connective tissue, the soft tissue to get in. But the rest of the regeneration is really hard, well organized. And you can see 
how the drilling is like drilling a new vital bone, the original vital bone. You see how the chips come out in the drills. You see how the bone looks well vascularized, looks like real native bone because we are using patient's real bone. Good density, we can feel, feel it on the, on the drilling. And we are inserting our implants on the regenerated bone with good primary stability. Of course, I tend to use large implants in order to match the most apical bone, which is the original native bone, because I'm not always uh, trusting the bone, big bone augmentations, and I don't know how they evolve with time. So my problem is that I don't want to be a carpenter inside patient's mouth. And using this uh, technique, although the, the outcome is amazing, it's really difficult, especially in some posterior accesses like this, to always have this, the perfect scaffold, always have the perfect dimensions of the cortical plate, always um, good, do a good splitting, always collect the, 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 the perfect amount of bone tights, uh, tighten the, the, the uh, autogenous chips is really difficult to do it in a, in a predictable way. I don't want to have uh, one single amazing case for Congress presentations. I want to have 20 good cases in a row in a daily routine, always the same uh, outcome for patient satisfaction. It, that is what, for, um, what, for what I work for. So I want to be sure that I'm, I want a technique that I have a technique that I can always have the same outcome. So this is hard to achieve and I suffer a lot. I, I'm a most, much more uh, nervous surgeon when I'm performing QA techniques in, in these complicated, um, this complicated um, techniques. And I want something that allows me to be more predictable and to be sure that I will always have this type of outcome. So you see the outcome of this, um, this case. This is something that I see a lot of times that using only autogenous bone, um, I can't seem to find a very specific um, scientific evidence on this, but in some way, the, 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 the body recognizes uh, only native bone underneath our flaps. And somehow there is a much, um, a much automatic uh, repositioning, apical repositioning on, of the mucogingival line, then when comparing other type of uh, uh, bone grafting procedures using, uh, call, uh, using other type of barriers and other type of uh, uh, non-osteogenic materials. Somewha somehow, I don't need also to mobilize so much coronally the flaps, and a lot of times I don't need to make any type of intervention, soft tissue intervention to reposition the mucogingival line apically again. And I always end up with good cretinized tissue around my implants in the posterior area. I'm talking the posterior area manually. But nowadays, to be more consistent, what I like to do is to make use of digital tools to be more uh, predictable and more consistent. So I don't like to be... Uh, to adapt my patients uh, to my uh, regular conventional tools because each patient is very specific, each patient is very unique. So we should um, diagnose the patient, its anatomical landmarks and its defects and create scaffolds specifically for those patients in those defects. That allows us to be much more predictable and it will um, help us to be uh, uh, less stressful and less time consuming in the surgeries. So you, you see here uh, an horizontal and vertical bone deficiency in the uh, uh, anterior upper jaw. And you saw in the digital planning how we access the defect. We emulated the, um, the, the amount of bone we needed according to the prosthetic design we were determining. And so we created a scaffold which is an, a customized titanium mesh that is going to make the perfect scaffold for the defect according to the prosthetic design that we established. So you see once again uh, separating, uh, cutting the periosteum to advance passively the, the, the flap, 
um, I did a second incision to separate in a parallel way the muscle fibers from the flap. For me, this is critical for the maxillary area to have a good uh, uh, passive cr free, free closure and also without any type of movement on the wound. So this titanium mesh already, already is designed for the defect and so it keeps stable only in one position. It has already the screw access holes created for the fixation of this, uh, of this mesh. And so very easily what we were planning in the, in, in the, um, in the software, we achieved the same scaffolding, the same position with the exact amount of bone we need to create at, in the exact position, in the exact vertical height. So this is really difficult to do hand-free. When you, you use conventional uh, non-resolvable barriers, you need to bend those barriers, you need to, um, uh, uh, you need to mold and fold those barriers in order to create the scaffold. It's very stressful to do it in the moment of the surgery. It takes a lot of experience, technically sensitive, and you might have some failures. You might have some problems in achieving the same, uh, the same amount of bond that you are expecting. You might have some problems in uh, be sure that you tighten really well inside the scaffold all the, the, the particles and see that with this type of mesh, which is the, the holes are really big, it will also allow the periosteum to be quickly in contact uh, with the bone graft and allows a very good revascularization. So for the first uh, weeks of healing, obviously we need a collagen membrane to avoid the soft tissue invasion of the defect, but it will resolve really quickly. And after that, our periosteum very early is going to be in contact with the uh, grafting material due to these uh, big openings of the titanium mesh. So I really like those titanium meshes uh, digitally designed because of this as well. I'm doing uh, soft tissue grafting occlusally on top of the crest because it, uh, it helps a lot to um, prevent an exposure of these membranes because there's always risky and we can always have exposition of the, the membrane. So it's a double layer of protection and at the same time it's going to create um, an excess of vertical tissue that is going to be critical for uh, the, the management of the emergence profile aesthetically in the, in the, in the later stages. So now after that we are closing the flaps passively, tension-free sutures. A lot of times, like in big augmentations like this, we need um, uh, different layers of uh, horizontal mattress sutures to have a passive free closure. You know, you see the healing after two weeks. Of course, we avoid any contact from the provisional prosthesis on top of the ridge. After one month, removing the sutures. And now, after nine months of healing, uneventfully, you see the heel ridge, you see how the thickness of the soft tissue graft was critical to not having any type of exposure, a nice soft tissue healing, and now we are re-entering. In this case, has, it is vertical and we have a mix of uh, autogenous bone with uh, xenograft. We are going to wait nine months for complete healing. And now we are gently re-entering like we should always re-enter an, uh, 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 an augmented site is always difficult to do a, a full split, split thickness, uh, um, sorry, a full thickness flap. And we access the regenerated bone, we access the membrane. And the bad news about this technique is that these meshes are rigid, they are not flexible. So you are going to unscrew the mesh and it's not going to move, it's not going to come out in one piece. So we will have to cut the mesh in different parts in order to remove it. It's actually, uh, uh, it's actually um, a very tough situation, it's not pleasant, but you need to do it. But you can see how we had no invagination of soft tissue inside the scaffold. So it's, um, it was a perfect healing. And at the same time, you can see the organization of the bone. You can see how the newly formed bone is dense, is compact, 
and it's well vascularized. After removing all the mesh, cleaning all these particles of titanium, you can see the organization of the bone, you can see how it looks vascularized. And after this, I didn't want to ruin everything with bad implant positioning, so I wanted to do it completely guided because it's very easy in multiple uh, teeth cases uh, to have some deviations of the perfect emergence and in a very sensitive case like this, after so much work, so much suffering for the patient, I didn't want to ruin the emergence profiles and I wanted to have the exact uh, position for my, my implants. So it's not only to guide uh, buccal, lingually and uh, interproximally, but also to have the proper deepness according to the, the, the planning of the teeth of this patient. It's a much more comfortable surgery. And after implant placement, we will have the correct distribution at the correct deepness. In this way, we were so much more predictable in um, accomplishing the right amount of bone and the correct positioning with less effort, with more predictability, and um, in avoiding long periods of time during the surgery because um, these surgeries are so much faster because we have already the scaffold prepared. It's one of the main advantages. But still, there are cases in the anterior area which is very common to have this kind of defects. So I'll, I must say that in most cases of uh, insufficient bone, we are facing this kind of defect in the anterior area. And I still have the same question. Where is the limit? Where is the limit? Where is the limit that um, makes me go through these complicated procedures, not so predictable in my hands, not so stable over time? In which cases, I may not have the complete amount of bone to have the fully the full implant 300 degrees surrounded by bone but I have just enough to do soft tissue augmentation and keep it simple and make it more predictable in my hands so in these cases I always ask is it really needed to rebuild the bone well in the heel ridges when I have enough bone to place my implants i know i'm putting my bone inside the uh, i'm sorry I'm, do, I'm, do, I'm putting my implant inside the remaining bone if i have enough bone for the implant i know that only with soft tissue grafting i can um uh, i can rebuild the horizontal or even vertical soft tissue defect in order to uh, match the desired contour for my uh, definitive restoration and end up with a nice emergence profile, with my teeth emerging with a natural looking from the gums of, of the patient. So if I have a rigid deficiency in a healed crest, which we always have, if we have enough bone, only soft tissue is enough to rebuild that deficiency. Uh, just by curiosity, I did a quiz with this case today. A lot of people is failing to understand where is the, the where is the the natural the the implant and where is the natural teeth because we actually ended up. You failed. I know, Ahmed, you failed <laughs> because actually by using uh, hypertrophic grafts like from tuberosity, even though the interproximal bone peaks is far away from the, 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 the measures that we know nowadays. We are not so much more depending, uh, we are not so depending of the bone crest as we were uh, depending in the past. So what happens in time is that it always gets better. After three years, you see how the tissue is stable. Actually, the papilla is longer and longer and the integration is even better with time. I used to do this quiz uh, a few years ago at the beginning like in the in the first healing of stages and a lot of people would notice that it was on 22 because of this scar that you see right there on the papilla but with time it tends to be better and better and better and nowadays it's even more difficult to understand where is the, um, the, the, the implant and where is the natural teeth. So you see how the horizontal defect is keeping stable, is rebuilt, it's playing its aesthetic and comfort role for the patient during time. When I really have to augment bone, what I seem 
to 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 um, to um, w w what I always um, experience with time is that the final outcome is never the same aesthetically speaking. Every time I have to mobilize more flaps, more extensive flaps to make bone regeneration, I end up with a, a worse aesthetic outcome because of the texture, because of the soft tissue color, because of some scars. So in the bigger and wider the bone augmentations are is even more difficult. You see two different cases uh, from from canine to canine in which the aesthetic outcome of the soft tissues as bigger it is the bone augmentation, the worse it is the aesthetic outcome of the soft tissues uh, at the end of the rehabilitation. Because it's obvious, the more you move the tissues, the more you cut, the more you raise the, 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 the tissue, the most difficult it is to end up with a, a good aesthetic of the, the soft tissues at the end. So let's see extreme, more extreme cases in which we can avoid bone regeneration and what is the limit, because we are getting close to our question, what is the limit in which I can avoid bone augmentations and I can solve it only with soft tissues? So let's see, this Nowadays, it's not so uh, surprising to me that when I have this um, emergence profile, it is surrounding this implant, which is outside the bone. It is without any cortical plate um, uh, until the apex of the implant. This is the beginning of the case. So you see how um, we have an implant on 22, with uh, apical recession, you see the grayish tissue because you can see the implant, um, you can detect the implant to the transparency of the implant in the abutment. And this is the uh, CBCT scan again. So this is a platform 4.0 uh, um, millimeter implant, external hexagon in a lateral incisor. It's not the proper platform, it's not the proper um, connection, um, and the implant, it's not that buckly position. So the emergence of the screw axis O is at the incisal edge. It's not that buckly. But this implant, of course, needed a bone augmentation. Probably it needed a soft tissue grafting. And it needed a thinner implant, of course. A narrow implant, of course. So because it was not that buckle, I decided to keep the implant and to uh, only solve the aesthetic problem with soft tissue. Because if I remove the implant, I'm not sure a lot of times, especially in lateral incisors, if I will be able to rebuild the uh, same amount of bone to keep the proper pink and white balance at the end. So I will get into more procedures, more long periods of healing, more um, um, expenses for the patient, more suffering for the patient. So I always try to understand if there is a shorter path for my patient with less uh, steps uh, on the treatment plan to solve the case. So this is the uh, general overall smile of the patient. I did uh, a motivational mock-up so the patient could understand how we could have a, a better harmony, general harmony, if we change something in the, the neighboring teeth. So we are um, having this motivational mock-up in which the both central incisors have a mock-up on top of the gingiva emulating a crown lengthening. But still, the margin of 22 is way too apical, of course. So we keep the mock-up during the surgery. And now I'm going to do um, a, a coronal advanced flap, like if it was a modified coronal advanced flap around an area and not only around a teeth. So I'm accessing with partial thickness. It was, um, it was uh, possible to keep partial thickness around the implant to not to expose the threads of the implant. I do the crown lengthening by um, uh, uh, doing the anatomy of the bone three millimeters away from the CJ. And now harvest, harvesting soft tissue grafting from the palates, depitalize outside the mouth, only to have one millimeter of lamina propria, which is the best 
thick tissue for these uh, reconstructions, we don't need to augment too much. If we try to augment with thicker than this, it's going to be really hard to revascularize and we can have problems of revascularization of the graft. So this technique, and this is an advantage from the, the flat techniques uh, uh, when compared to tunnel techniques, is that we can really suture the graft on this position, on this specific position with this specific anatomy, with this specific form, and it is really immobilized, non-mobile because it's attached and it's sutured to the bone um, with this partial thickness um, uh, flaps. This is the advancement of the flap splitting the thickness above the mucogingival junction in order to make the advancement of the flap. And now we had already agreed with the patient that we would uh, submerge the implant temporarily because submerging the implant, it will allow me to advance much more the tissues that if I had the, uh, a provisional screw retained crown. If I have a, prov uh, a provisional screw retained crown, it will stop me and prevent me to advance more the tissue. So this way I can advance so much more. So we are going to uh, provisionalize with a Maryland bridge on 22 and we wait for the first healing. So three months after the CT, CTG, we have this type of outcome. So you can see already how the color of the, the tissue is changing, it's getting better. And this is the motivational mock-up I did to the, to the patient. So here we are already determining the outcome, um, the general outcome that we are having with the other teeth as well. And this is the amount of uh, gain, horizontal gain we had with the first craft. So you remember already the horizontal depression that we had, and you know that we grafted only one millimeter thickness. And look how now we have much more than one millimeter of gain, only with that one millimeter of lamina proper, because these thick tissues have the tendency to increase with time. In, in only three months, we have already much more volume matching the horizontal contour of the neighboring uh, roots. And also we moved coronally the mucogingival junction, but automatically due to the thickness of this graft, the, origin, the, the mucogingival junction is already at the same level as, uh, as it began. Now the patient was already desperate for having a screw retained tooth because the Maryland bridge was, was always coming off and breaking. So I did the re-entering, but for having a little bit more of papilla, because we had flat papilla, I did a small tunneling, a little bit more connective tissue grafts, and it's going to be sutured the most coronal I, I can, neighboring the papillas. So we keep the provisional screw retained tooth with the mock-up. These are the veneer preparations. Actually, the veneer preparations were made by uh, Rosana Mendes, my wife. She's uh, working with me on this case. And she bonded the veneers and kept the provisional restoration on the implant. This was the moment in, in which the, the buccal shell of the provisional uh, broke and the patient came to the office. And I can see that we have um, over contour of the grafts, the color is not perfect, the texture is not perfect. So uh, in these cases, I do a little bit of peeling with a diamond bore, which always help to get better integration of the grafts with the neighboring tissues. And this is how we get to this point with this uh, perfect good emergence profile matching the neighbor teeth. And the aesthetic problem that we began is already solved. So now it's comfortable to do the final definitive zirconia crown uh, on this, um, on this um, uh, emergence profile. This uh, work, um, this ceramic work is from Olympia Urban, a uh, very talented Polish ceramist. And I forgot to say that the previous work that we saw, the, the, the single implant on 22 was uh, from Bruno Pinheiro, a Portuguese ceramist. I always like to give credits to the amazing ceramists that work with us. And so after this, we have this integration of the definitive crown in zirconia on implant. We will never have, of course, the same height of the papilla has the opposing side because we have not even 
the perfect connection of the implant in the perfect um, diameter. But due to the individualization of the, of the uh, ceramic pieces, we can have a good harmony. So you can see the bulky emergence profile, and I'm pretty sure that this thick non-mobile tissue will never ever going to have a recession and it will not uh, uh, be possible to be to contaminate the implant that is exposed in the bone because of the thickness and because of non-mobility the non-mobility is very important and you can see some more insights of the integration of how to reconstruct the soft tissue around a previously badly placed, badly positioned implant. And you can see how we got the harmony. We got the harmony not only by uh, regenerating vertically the margin of 22, but also by cron lengthening the two central incisors. And give, this helps to give the perfect harmony for the smile, and especially the impact on patient smile is really huge. And I, I, I don't really like to have uh, the initial photo without makeup and the final photo with makeup. But the truth is that we create such an impact in patients' lives that they completely change their mindset and their, um, and their uh, self-confidence. And this happens a lot to me. So you can see the overall uh, outcome is really pleasant. And this can happen in even uh, more extreme situations. Like when we have extremely badly positioned implants, you can see here... Uh, buckly placed implant that is outside the bony the bony uh, um, the bony envelope of the adjacent teeth in in the other lateral incisor we have a tissue level implant so i was prepared to remove the implant on 12 until i understand that the implant and the cbct has no buccal wall and no palatal wall if i remove the implant i will create such a vertical defect that i will have to send my implant to iran to Omid be able to regenerate such amount of bone to end up really nice. So I decided, as I don't have always that potential in my hands, to create only soft tissue enough to cover the implant. So it was needed one surgery to do <coughs> a coronally advanced flap. My first intention was to create thickness enough for the second uh, surgery because we know already that the potential of revascularization and regeneration of these defects on top of avascular um, uh, beds like an implant are not so good. So you can see that we didn't have enough coverage. And after the second surgery with proper thickness, we can do a tunneling and the tunnel will allow me to move the margins even more uh, coronally. So you see that only after the second surgery, we were able to cover enough uh, our exposed implants and abutments. So after that, I did the preparation of the neighboring teeth for ceramic veneers. And now you can see how we were able to uh, cover the best we can, of course, the apical mar the, the margins of laterals are a little bit apical than the centrals because the, the there was a very tough situation but you can see how much we gained horizontally and vertically and how much the tissue is stable of course the implant 12 as it is outside the bony uh, envelope it's it is against everything that we and know already about this subject of covering implants. But the truth is that with already two years follow-up, things are stable and I, I'm still curious about what, it, what will happen in the future. Um, but until now, things are working pretty much fine. Or in pontic uh, sites, like in this case, after a, a failed vertical GBR in which we have um, we don't have infection, there is no infection. This is uh, roots on the canines, implant on 21, then implant on 12. And after this failure, uh, a colleague asked me to um, try again the vertical GBR to, um, to solve the problem. So I will have to work with non-favorable -favorable bone intraproximal peaks, and it was not 
um, so predictable in my hands than working only with the soft tissues. So I thought if we don't have infection on my implant, we only have dyesense uh, due, to the, due to the failure of the vertical GBR. And as we have a pontic site on 22, in pontic sites, it's so much more easy to um, do vertical augmentations only with soft tissue because we have a closed environment. We don't have contact, you know, we don't have communication from the oral environment with the inside of the bone. So we can keep our soft tissue stable only by grafting soft tissue. So by Vista technique, under tunnel, without incision on the crest, which is very critical, without incision on the crest, we can mobilize the tissues, we can graft by Vista approach coronally on top of the crest, we can use double cross sutures on the provisionals to mobilize everything coronally. And after two months, I thought already that I would have, uh, uh, that I won the game because I cover the exposed implant. We only did some, uh, um, some air uh, powder conditioning of the surface through the tunnel. And I got what I wanted, covering the implant and moving the tissue on 22 to the critical contour. In the interproximal areas, we would use the prosthesis to um, mimic the papillas that we didn't have. But with time, this is the beauty of the thick grafts of soft tissue. They have the tendency to get better and better. Even after nine months, when we change the provisionals to start managing the emergence profile, we see the tissue is going on top of the provisionals, is advancing coronally. After 12 months, it's going more and more on top of the provisionals. This is not creeping attachment. There is no attachment to roots, but somehow there is some uh, attachment of this um, uh, newly formed soft tissue on top of our restorations. And only after 18 months, by managing the emergence profiles of the provisionals, we were able to get stability of the margins of the scalloping in order to finish this work with um, with a, a cemented crowns on the canines in a bridge from 12 to 22 with the pontic site on 22. This is a work by uh, Bruno Pinheiro as well. Only after 18 months, 18 months, we don't always have to wait this longer. This is because it was a very specific case in which uh, the uh, graft was so hypertrophic that we needed to give time for, for it to stabilize in order to communicate the volume in the shape to the final restoration to the lab uh, technician. So, of course, you see how this is only possible because the big defect is in a pontic area. So, we have a pontic area that we don't have and a biology quiz, we don't have contact with the, with the interior. So the graft is stable. But if we put an implant at the, 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 the position of 22, of course, we will have recession because there will be a sulcus, there will be a biologic quiz, and there will be a reorganization of all the soft, the, the, the soft tissues in order to prevent bone resorption. Around 21, of course, there is the major risk is not recession. The risk is fracture of the implant. I don't fear recession because the, the, the soft tissue is thick and it's non-mobile. But you'll see it, it's non-mobile. But the problem can be fracture of the implant 21 because it has no bone 360. Okay, but as it is a bridge and it is splinted with the other implant and the occlusion of the implant of the patient is not that risky, I think we will not have problem for so long, but imagine any other type of procedure to solve this case with the same aesthetics and the same outcome in the same period of time. So only with soft tissue, only in one single surgery, we were able to uh, deliver a good pink and white balance for this patient. And you can see after two months, after two months, a follow-up, you can see the impact this had on patient's smile. And you can also see in video the most important thing to me, to prevent any type of um, recession, it's important that this tissue is not only thick, but it's normal. We move the lip and the sulcus doesn't move. 
that's the most important thing because of course do we have a pocket of course if we probe we will probe until the the, the until the bone but if we have good thickness there is some kind of sealing not exactly like to a root but some kind of sealing that prevent in a patient with good hygiene to have contamination of the inside and last case let's discuss in a more simple case not only extreme cases this is a case from uh, tooth 11 in which patients start having symptoms because of this horizontal and uh, sorry internal and external bone uh, root resorption and what was uh, frightening to me is that um, after removing this, this this tooth i know that i don't have distal bone peak and i'm not really sure if i will have my uh, mesial bone peak to uh, remain after the extraction so if i raise a flap here to do a bone augmentation i will probably be really limited in the amount of bone i will gain or is uh, vertically so i talked to the patient and i said well probably uh, if we work only with remaining bone you will have a larger tooth but you can augment we can uh, 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 crown lengthen the other the other syndrome uh, yeah, but still i don't want my teeth to be really large than that okay so we will need to do some kind of augmentation but for me at least for me i think that vertical augmentation of one single tooth is the most difficult vertical situation to do. I prefer to do vertical augmentation of an extended area in the posterior mandal. For example, I think Omid agrees with me. He's doing like this. So I think he's agreeing with me. So much more easy than doing only in the static area between two teeth, especially if we don't have the interpersonal bone peak. A lot of times, of course, we can extract another tooth to have the other interpersonal bone peak and play with that. But if I do that, I'm putting it very risky if I don't accomplish the perfect goal to the patient to the, to the end. So how can I play it safe? How can I uh, do something more predictable that can allow me to have the same final outcome without so, uh, so risky procedures? So I did the extraction of the tooth and preserving the sockets of uh, preserving the so the, the uh, sorry the contour of the sockets is really important never raise a flap never split the papillas is going to be the clue until the end and every time i have a socket um in which the margin is at the correct position i try to never ever raise a flap even though i don't have the buckle wall i can still do the preservation of the socket it will work like an ice cream cone technique from Dennis Tarno, but with soft tissue grafting instead of the collagen membrane. So I moved a pedicle rotated uh, connective tissue flap from the palate. I fill the socket with xenograft, which all, we know it's the material that um, it's better for the volume maintenance. It's not uh, osteogenic, but it's going to uh, uh, maintain the volume. And we do the pedicle rotated flap uh, buckley in order to uh, allow to maintain the bone in place and at the same time to augment the sides of soft tissue and close the entrance of the socket. So I'm using the patient's own teeth, bonded to adjacent teeth as provisional. You see how we are cutting the 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 the, the, the provisional. I always test my tunnel. I see how coronally I can get, and then I cut the tooth in order to give room in space for the soft tissue. After one week, we see already, although the inflammation, how the soft tissue graft is revascularizing. And after six months, this is what I want to get, excess of tissue, so that when I understand the critical design contours for my two central incisors we have enough tissue already so the papilla was not grafted the papilla was not created the papilla is already there i only didn't move the papilla area so when i reshape the contour of my reach i'm going to have 
the papilla. So I will only create, what I always do in this case is only create excess of tissue so that this coronal excess of tissue is the level of the papilla. Uh, the, when, when we don't have bone peaks, we can't expect to play with the contact point and expect to have papilla. Those are old times. That only happens if we have the interproximal bone peak. So after the um, creation of these uh, contours, we do all the digital planning, we send the initial STL file, we send the mock-up STL file, we know what where is the critical contour of our teeth. So what is critical is not to open a flap to place the implant. Uh, if I open the flap to put in my implant, I will be silly because probably I will not have a really perfectly organized and well vascularized bone. So I will probably uh, move the xenograft aside and I could lose the volume created because the xenograft I placed was not to create real bone. It's only to create some uh, contour support to support the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic area. So I have to place my implants flapless and if it is guided, even better. So the guide to do the gingivectomy of 21 and the guide to place my implants in the perfect 3D positioning at the correct deepening and now another CTG to boost a little bit more horizontally the tissue and the um, immediate provisional screw retain. You see that we could have the perfect deepening of the implant because it was digitally guided. If I could, if I would have to do it hand-free, it will be really difficult to know where to stop screwing the provisional at the end of the surgery. And at this moment, I realized that uh, both central incisors doesn't have the same uh, horizontal width. So I did um, a composite veneer on the other tooth uh, after the surgery, a few weeks after the surgery, for the patient to understand that uh, she would have to do a veneer on the other central incisor to get the proper matching of both central incisors. But look how after this period of time, we already have the perfect soft tissue contour with the perfect color, with the perfect texture, without losing any kind of papilla. If we did any other kind of procedure, especially bone grafting procedures, if we um, raised the papilla, we would end up without any papilla for sure. Because the papilla is supported by the tooth, the neighboring tooth. But if we raise the papilla without any, without any, if we uh, break the attachment that this papilla has to the root and raise a flap, we will then depend of the bone peak that doesn't exist to create a papilla. So never raising the papilla, never cutting the papilla is what allowed me to keep the papilla from beginning to the end. We only kept the papilla in place. So this is uh, the final uh, restoration, zirconia restoration in, in, in feldspathic veneer on the other central incisor, also a work from uh, Bruno Pinheiro, the Portuguese ceramist. And I can't imagine a quicker, simpler, with less procedures, most cost-effective treatment for my patient to end up in the same way. What happens inside in this transition zone? I'm pretty sure, and now finally answer the question, we will not find this question answered in the literature, but my clinical experiences by gathering all the scientific information and clinical information we have is that if I have the palatal wall at the correct vertical level, and if I have two thirds of the implant totally surrounded by vital bone, I will not be struggling a lot to have vital bone around the buccal coronal third of my implant. Because on that area, I only want to have something like xenograft and soft tissue graft that I'm pretty sure it doesn't restore with time. It's only preventing the contamination of the treated surface of the implant and it prevents any type of uh, recession over time. It's only supporting aesthetically and it's preventing contamination. If I have two thirds of the implant surrounded by bone, I'll just want to put my implant, large implants, apically, palatally, that is going to keep those integration. And thinking like that, a lot of difficult demanding cases in the aesthetic zone will have much better aesthetic outcome with most more cost-effective um, treatment for the patient.
Okay, I hope it was clear and I'm ready for all my questions right now. Thank you for your patience and thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Paulo. It was, it was just superb and everything is clear. Thank you. Places, beautiful management. Um, for, for our audience, I think uh, we, can, um, we can have some questions. Maybe it's in their mind and maybe it's good for the review. Uh, one of the things that I really liked about the presentation was the importance of that soft tissue thickness vertically that you mentioned. And it was also very beautifully demonstrated at Thomas Linkiewicz's book, Zero Bone Loss Concepts. And as you said, it's not only about soft tissue, but also prosthetic part play a very important role, type of connections, the depth of placement, splinting, non splinting and all these factors can have influence on the final outcome. One of my questions is that case that presented with titanium, the, the computer made titanium mesh, uh, computer guided. Uh, as you presented, it was absolutely beautiful, but as you said, needing for uh, cutting the mesh to bring it out and uh, the need for completely reflect the flat to unscrew the screws. Do you think that comparing to this technique, techniques like Huri technique work uh, easier? I'm not gonna say uh, more predictable because the shape with that titanium mesh definitely gonna be better suited for the out of the augmentation, but considering the difficulty in execution of the technique, what's your idea about it? Well, it's a very good question. I think that's, uh, for me, it's obvious that um, I need to analyze each patient very specifically because each patient is really unique. So when I access the defects of my patient and I, accept, I access and diagnose the goal I want to have on my treatment, when I realize that the defect is not really even, are really like this defect. If you remember the defect, it was really an even if we thought it 3D dimension, horizontally and vertically, it was a very difficult defect. So when I imagine myself um, uh, creating the scaffold with cortical plates, we are not so bendable, we are not, which are not uh, so flexible. Um, it's, I, uh, my mind already thinks of having something uh, already pre-made, uh, digitally made, that can have this, the scaffold perfectly. When it is a defect that is um, uh, more or less even, uh, in which I can accommodate really easy and quickly the cortical plates that I'm going to fit my, my defect very perfectly, I will go for a query technique. That happens especially in more contained defects, not so wide defects. But I will tell one thing about this um, customized meshes. The main advantage I, I, I see on those is that, of course, if we think about it, to be rigid and to be uh, applicable like that, uh, it has to be thick. And of course, you can imagine that using thick barriers, we can uh, go uh, through much more chances of exposures. So I realized that uh, you have to um, choose the proper patients for it and choose the proper indications. Because when you have those type of thickness of a barrier, it's not for thin periodontum. If the periodontum is thick, of course, you will be uh, uh, less chance of exposure. But if it is thin, those one, two millimeters of um, thin periodontum, probably the chance of exposure is going to be really high. So in this particular case, the periodontum was really thick. You can access it on the CBCT scan. If you do it with the lip retraction or with the periodontal probe, you can uh, totally access it. And um, uh, even though it was thick, I still did the connective tissue graft on top of the crest to be a double layer of protection. So for me, this is really important. So the main problem of these uh, customized meshes is that you can't apply to a lot of patients. And especially in the posterior area, for example, it might be uh, in the posterior mandible area is going to be a lot more risky and with a lot of more chances of exposure. And, and one of the things that... Um... I enjoyed during the presentation of the augmentation is that this is actually one of the points that I really like and I really thought about it during my practice. So many practitioners tend to do over augmentation 
in huge cases. And I think mm -hmm. that it's one of the things that makes the procedure more complicated because we can only build predictable bone in the bony housing, not putting too much bone, only increase the risk of exposures or complications. And I really saw it in both of your cases with Kuri technique and also in titanium meshes. So I think it's a very good point that not to do the over augmentation, there is no point in it and we will lose the bone and more risk for the exposure. I'm pretty, I'm, I, I pretty agree with you. And of course it's reflected on my cases. I think that that concept came from augmentations with uh, resorbable membranes and um, and non osteogenic materials. Of course, with that there is a tendency to overbuild because the contraction of the materials is a lot in the healing process. And of course, um, even overbuilding, you will have so much more difficulty in handling the soft tissues and closing the flaps, and still the outcome. Uh, the amount of bone you are going to uh, create in the, after the healing process is not always reliable. It's not, um, it's not valid. there is no point in having uh, such amount of non-vital bone because you can have uh, the volume support, the aesthetic volume support from the soft tissues has, I think it was uh, pretty much obvious during this presentation. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the last points that I want to mention, I think uh, it's also very important to think about the abutment contours uh, in treating the complicated cases, like the one that you presented in the lateral incisors. I think it's also very important to flatten the, uh, the, the buccal contour of the abutment to make soft tissue grafts and stability more stable. And um, also, uh, I want to know your experience in type of the soft tissue graft you prefer to choose in doing the soft tissue uh, augmentation in uh, increasing the contour do you prefer to go from the palate or from the tuberosity look um first mentioning the um, the prosthetic part which i'm a i'm a big fan i'm i don't consider my myself uh specifically a perio guy i'm a perio prosto guy because i do a lot of uh, prosthetic work and when I do one thing I'm doing another uh, and I'm I, uh, I'm doing both at the same time and thinking both at the same time since the very first beginning on the diagnosis of the cases and I think it's um, nowadays it's very well known and the the, the, the very recent article from um, and suing Oscar Gonzalez that uh, after 10 years of the Bible of critical and subcritical contour, they are more and more reflecting the, 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 the clinical evidence that we were already experienced in the, in the, in the recent years that was um, in the first healing of stages with, uh, with the grafting procedures giving space uh, on the subcritical contour, creating flat or concave subcritical contours, allowing space for graft maturation in excess coronally for them play with excess of tissue uh, uh, after the maturation, after the healing process in order to um, rebuild, recontour the margin and create a movement for the soft tissues to go interprosomally to boost the papilla. So nowadays it's, it's very, uh, there, there might be some slight changes from case to case, but the, the main thinking is, is, is that one. So uh, I always say to, to the people that come to me with a lot of doubts that the first, in, in every type of mucogingival reconstruction, the first step of the treatment is always prosthetic, never surgical. Because every time it, you, you, you think first in which incision you'll do it, when you start first with the blade and not with the prosthesis, you are already risking to be limited in the amount of, uh, um, of, of reconstruction you can achieve because you first need to prepare, to prepare your prosthesis to receive in the in the, the at the correct level with the proper shape, the first surgery for then recreate with with the prosthetic contour uh, how you want to achieve at the end. And the other question you talked is uh, about uh, can you remember what is the second part? Or palette as a source in software. Oh yes, okay. Uh, both are good as long as we uh, as long as we are going to the the posterior part of palate or pos or tuberosity we are always um, finding a very dense thick tissue because it's more uh, it's richer in, in lamina propria so a lot of times I really need uh, a huge amount 
of bone like a block, like in the case of, in a vertical case, to cover the implant and do the vertical augmentation 22, I didn't have tuberosity. So a lot of times I have this problem. I don't have the tuberosity. Be or because I have the wisdom tooth, or because uh, it's a very tiny tuberosity for the defect I, I have. You can always go to the palate. It has a depitalized free gingival graft and fold it to have a, a thick block like a tuberosity. If I tend to use more the tuberosity for uh, contain defects, mesiodistally, one teeth, two teeth max. When I need to do something wider, I need to use from the palate because it allows me to have a more extensive graft in which the final outcome in terms of volume is going to be more even because the tuberosity, you always have some uneven volumes at the end that it's not aesthetically pleasant. And also it's the most hypertrophic graft you can have. So a lot of times we experience um, uh, hypertrophic problems of the graft, like if it was uh, with uh, uh, ugly, scary tissue, or like if it was uh, an uncontrolled volume like a tumor. A lot of people talk about that experience. I realize that it happens a lot when you graft under underneath mucosa and not creatinized tissue. So tuberosity is really good to uh, graft when you have a big volume deficiency, but you have a good width of cretinized tissue. So you have the deficiency, but you have cretinized tissue. When you put the, the, the tuberosity graft underneath the cretinized tissue, the amount of volume you will gain is going to be contained by the cretinized tissue itself. It's, that it's not so elastic. When you put underneath big defects with only mucosa or, or with a lot of mucosa, what happens is that the mucosa is really flexible, it's really elastic, and it's not containing the, 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 the hypertrophic graft. So you will have those type of exposures of the graft with um, different um, aesthetic outcomes that are not so pleasant. That's my experience with tuberosity graft. So a lot of cases I choose very well the indication and a lot of times I'm using from the palate uh, like, like a, a rectangle. Perfect. Thank you so much, Paulo. I'm sure that all the audience have enjoyed your presentation and uploaded very soon on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Perfect. so people around the world can enjoy it. I'm sure Iranians have enjoyed it so much as me. It was again my pleasure and for all the audience, uh, Paulo going to be our, one of our speakers at 2021 Fifth International Symposium of Complications in Infant Dentistry in Tehran. We're looking forward to be the host in Tehran and Enjoy again your valuable work. Thank you so much again for joining us, Paulo. It was a pleasure and hope to I see you. A pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.